We are familiar with the concept that planets form after the star has formed, but how exactly they form is a very contentious issue. The mainstream gravity-only model, Hannes Alvin's hybrid model, and then the electric universe model are all at odds with each other. As our telescopes improve, we are starting to see more images of this process. So which model will most closely compare with the images we see? Let's find out. There have been two very recent images released which show this process in action. So let's examine each in more detail. First up is an image taken using the ALMA telescope. It is an image of a young star, TW Hydra, some 200 light years from Earth. In the outer edge of the ring, they think that they may have captured a planet in the process of forming. This is an area in the ring which seems to have caused the dust or gas or plasma to clump together more closely. And this is no small cloud either. It's spanning a length that is equal to the distance between Sun and Jupiter and has a width which is equal to the distance between Earth and the Sun. What we can also note in this diagram is the rings, darker in colour, which are present. Also, the centre area is much brighter. The star itself is located right at the centre, but you can't actually see it in this image. Now, this clump that we are discussing is forming about 52 times further out than the Earth is from our Sun. The brightness and elongated shape of this structure do not match the theoretical predictions for the mainstream gravitational model. It may therefore also be possible that this is nothing other than a gas vortex, which are thought to form around young stars in dust rings. Now before we examine the next image, let's examine some of the other features in this image and discuss any electrical effects we may be seeing. Firstly, this image reminds me of Saturn's rings. We see a finer, more dense inner ring, and then as we move out, the density seems to decrease. We also see clear, dark rings interspersing it. Now note, in the gravitational model, it is these darker bands where we would expect to find planetesimals, yet none can be observed in this image. Now, the likeness to Saturn's rings reminds me of Christian Birkeland's early experiment, where he produced ring-like plasma around a central sphere, very much like the rings we see in Saturn. So is this plasma and dust being driven into this structure by the ring currents around the star? The clump on the ring also reminds me of the wall structures we see on Saturn's rings, but obviously on a much more vast scale, and we don't understand what causes these wall structures to appear on Saturn's rings. And let's also not forget that in Hannes Alvin's jet stream model, this ring structure with darkened spaces is exactly what he predicted would happen. And I'm also reminded of Hannes Alvin's model for planetary formation, where he discussed the fact that depending on the material falling in towards the star, they would be stopped at their relative ionization points, and this could mean that different clouds would create different shells of material. Is that what we are seeing in this image, the inner part being more yellow than the outer part and therefore it is a different shell? Now at this stage I can't really say, as I'm not clear from this image what the actual colours represent, so it may be something completely different, but it was a thought that sprang to mind. Now, moving on to the second image, this was taken using both the Spitzer and Hubble telescope and they were actually able to image the atmosphere of a newly formed planet around the star Gliese 3470b. Now, this planet that formed is 12 times more massive than Earth, so it's a little bit smaller than Neptune. They expected to find an atmosphere which would contain trace amounts of other elements, such as uh, oxygen, nitrogen, ammonia, similar to what we see on other gas giants. But what they saw was an almost pristine atmosphere of hydrogen and helium, very much resembling the atmosphere of the star, 
more than that of a gas giant. This planet is also at odds with the gravitational model as in this model it is thought that most of these large gas giants would form further out and then migrate inwards and this one is orbiting very close to the star itself. In Alvin's jet stream and planetary model this could be accounted for by the fact that this planet would have formed at the same time as the star formed and would therefore have been generated from the same initial plasma cloud so would match the composition of the star. Planets further out in Alvin's model would be formed by other dust clouds the star passes through. So let's talk electric universe models of planetary formations. For some reason they do not include Hannes' ideas even though his are driven by electrical forces. Now the only model that I can find is based on the idea that stars can split. Now Donald Scott calls this stellar fissioning and this is not to be confused with nuclear fission. Now I briefly discussed this in the stellar evolution episode so a star if it undergoes a rapid increase in the incoming current can split into two and they don't necessarily have to be the same size in order that it reduces its electrical stress on the star because it would then effectively have a much greater surface area so the current density would decrease. Now there is also evidence to suggest that some stars that we have observed have suddenly acquired a companion after a significant brightening event. Now this would also explain why the composition would be so pristine because it was formed from the star itself. The Electric Universe, however, take planetary formation further than this and suggest that all planets are created in a similar process, ejected from the star as rocky bodies. So let's start with a simple premise that concepts help us to visualise an idea, but in order to develop these ideas and discuss them, at some stage you will have to write down this information. None of this exists for this idea. Even if you go back to stellar fissioning that we talked a minute ago, the splitting of stars, there are no papers on this. Nothing to provide any detail to allow a fruitful discussion. Now I personally find the concept of stellar fissioning appealing as we have some circumstantial evidence and electrically I like the idea of a star balancing its current density in this way. I'm just surprised that no one has ever written a paper on this. If we now look at the, the Thunderbolt's idea of planets being spat out, the story becomes even more murky. They often quote that gravitational models cannot account for the differing composition in planets, but that they can. And again, I can find no documentation that substantiates this. Why would one ejected planet look different from the other? What causes this process to happen? So. I understand it from a stellar fissioning point of view, but what would cause a planet to become ejected? And again, if we go back to the images of all the protoplanetary disks, we see that they all have two things in common. They all have a plasma or dust disk, which are orientated in the plane of rotation, and they all contain a banded structure. So where does that leave us? Well, to be quite frank, nowhere. We must be able to explain the reason for disks, the fact that planets are forming at various locations in the disks, the fact that there are empty bands that have no planets in them, and why planets would end up with differing compositions. At the moment, if we look back at all of these facts, only Hannes Alvin's model is able to explain all of these features. It is shunned by the mainstream as it uses electrical processes to kickstart it. It is shunned by the Electric Universe community because it employs gravity to complete the final collapse. Neither the gravity only model nor the EU model is capable of explaining all of the features that we see. In reality, I strongly feel that the solution lies somewhere in between. I think that there is merit in the stellar fissioning process and there is some evidence to support that this does happen. There is evidence that ring structures might be amplified or created by the electric currents flowing around the star. 
there needs to be a reason why this material is there in the first place. Alvin's model could explain the formation of planets within the rings, and it could even explain where the rings themselves came from. It doesn't, however, necessarily match with what we see on Saturn, the fact that some of these rings are dynamic and change, and that would imply that the electrical currents do drive the process of these rings. What needs to come out of the electric universe is something more concrete than web pages and videos. Someone needs to actually document the ideas so that others can discuss them. Now this may well exist, but it may be kept behind closed doors. I would struggle to understand the rationale behind this. It could also be that I'm just particularly rubbish at finding these documents. Now Jim has agreed to help me attempt to go down this rabbit hole to try and bring some clarity around the various models and look at what a future model might look like. So watch out for that in the future. Now let me know what you think. Do you think that the gravitational model is the best, that there is the hybrid Alvin model, or that the uh, idea that they are ejected from the, the stars is the model? Let me know down below in the comments. And also let me know if you have specific questions that you'd like to address or insights. And again, I will pick some of the best ones out to discuss next week. So let's come back to the comments from last week. Last week we looked at the FRB signal and the fact that there was potentially a pattern hidden within that. So first up was Joe Degelman, who pointed out that, um, and I, I'm not going to go into the detail of this, but effectively the, the Shapiro effect is, is uh, considered a proof of general relativity, which effectively causes the signals to be delayed because of the warping of space-time. Uh, and he pointed out, and I need to do a little bit more research on this, um, that the red end of the spectrum for a uh, pulsar, which is 200 light years away, uh, there is a difference of about a half a second compared to the gamma end. Uh, and again, that could be the same principle that we're seeing here on the FRBs. Nothing to do with the, the Shapiro effect, but more to do with the, this... Um, mechanism that causes the frequencies to shift so it's so a very interesting point and again I'm, I'm going to research that and also you know part of the thing that probably I'll be doing together with Jim is looking at this whole notion of of gravity and and where it applies and where we think it doesn't apply so the next comment is from Shifu and he says that this really ought to be testable under various conditions such as uh, artificially generated pinches and different plasma atmospheres and absolutely right uh, you know let's let's build as a lab and let's test this out so that we can prove it okay next up is from uh, raven kiefer who asks whether or not i've checked the frequencies against the Sophagio scale the fibonacci scale etc um so i i did i did do some more analysis on this so if we have a look, so originally when I uh, looked at the numbers, I just kind of grouped them. So the first stage was really to look at the, the spread. So the, the first diagram you see is the spread of the numbers. And one thing that becomes very obvious when you look at this is that there are two main groupings. So really we have values that, look, that at the moment lie below the, the thousand mark. Um, now, obviously, that is really dependent on the number of signals we receive. So I, I then did an analysis on that smaller segment, so up to a thousand. Then what I did is I then grouped them together into values that I thought were close enough together and then averaged those. And you can see in the chart, I've, I've color coded the ones that I uh, kind of grouped together. The, the yellow one is because, well, there wasn't anything to group it with. So I, I just left it on its own. So I then calculated the average, which is the, the uh, second column that you can see. And then I worked out what the gap was between each one of those values, which you can see underneath the gap column. And it's quite interesting, actually, because it doesn't seem to vary that much as we go up that scale. So the, they all seem to sort of range around 100. And at the bottom, you can see that the average gap is 97. And then I did a deviation. So how far was each one away from our, our average? and put that down and then put a percentage deviation. Now, interestingly enough, 
as we go further down, it seems to move further away from the average, both up and down. Now, this is, you know, a very rough statistical analysis of this. Um, what's clear is it, it doesn't seem to be like a Fibonacci or a Solfagio scale. It, it seems to be evenly spaced to some extent. Now, it depends on how you do these averages. And again, we need more data to make this work. There are some larger sets of data in there, like the 500 range and the 700 range are considerably larger than the other ones, which again is another interesting point to make as well. So I'm not sure that we can necessarily draw any more conclusions from this, but again, there is still this pattern that we're seeing inside of there. Okay, and then the, the last comment um, was from who did this? And, and I mean, I will summarize because he, he wrote down quite a lot of ideas, but basically what he was asking is if the filament imagine that the filament uh, was like uh, uh, an arcing uh, bolt and that moved so imagine it, it kind of uh, as we see lightning moving uh, in in the air what if the filament moved and obviously the the plasma and the filament can move extremely quickly and therefore left the the star behind which would then slowly catch up with that uh, film which has moved and, and that sort of when it reconnects that that would potentially cause the effect that we see which is a really interesting idea certainly in terms of when we look at the the, the dynamics of uh, Birkeland currents and how they work you know potentially that's something that, that might need further investigation the problem is I don't think it explains FRBs because the star would be active prior to that event happening so it would be emitting radiation in all spectrums and then it would go I presume the idea would be it would go dead for a period of time and then when it reconnects then it would ignite so giving a spark and the problem is that that spark if it still retains its its you know uh, action as a, as a star it would suddenly emit radiation in all frequencies and, and in fact probably there would be a large jolt so you would you would see a very sudden brightening event and again these frbs they are just radio there are no other frequencies that we detect but it, it's a good idea i do like it um so again if you've if you've got comments based on this video put them down there below and um we will discuss it uh, next week as always be brave be curious the truth is waiting for us until next time